Welcome to Newsmax TV. I'm Kathleen Walter. With us now in Washington is Elliot Abrams, a senior fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Mr. Abrams was a top National Security Council officer in the Bush White House. And Mr. Abrams, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be with you. President Obama said Tuesday he believes Congress will vote to authorize military action against Syria for Bashar al-Assad's alleged use of chemical weapons. The president says he's willing to work with lawmakers on the wording of a specific resolution. Should Congress vote for or against authorizing the strike? I think it should vote for authorizing the strike, assuming that the resolution in its terms is a decent one. Because I think that, that the taboo on using poison gas is at stake. I think the credibility of the United States is at stake. And I think we have a real national interest in seeing Iran uh, defeated in Syria. Senators John McCain and Lindsey Graham have had a, quote, candid exchange with the president on Syria. And Senator McCain warned on Monday that the consequences would be catastrophic if Congress votes against a military strike. Senator McCain's concern is that it would seriously undermine the U.S. in the, mid in the Mideast if we don't strike. You agree with that assessment then? Yeah, I do. In fact, I'd go further. I think it would undermine us more broadly. I mean, look at the countries like Japan, Australia, South Korea, Taiwan that are worried about China. Then you have the Middle Eastern countries worried about Iran. I think everywhere it, that would a, a no vote would give the sense that you just can't count on the United States anymore. Let's say Congress votes against a military strike. Secretary Kerry says that President Obama would still have the right to strike. Uh, the president has made a habit of acting unilaterally. Do you see the president striking anyways, and should he? You know, I think he had certainly had the, the power and the right to strike without going to Congress. I mean, he did it in Libya, uh, and other presidents have done it all the way back to President Reagan in Grenada and the first President Bush in Panama. But he, he made the decision to go to Congress, so I don't see how you can then ask for the authority and not get it and turn around and say, you know, never mind. Uh, so I think if he doesn't get it, it's going to be very hard for him to move forward anyway. Mm -hmm. Elliot, the GOP seems divided on whether to intervene in Syria. Speaker Boehner and Eric Cantor have come out in support of military action, but yet there are a number of Republicans who are mostly Tea Party affiliated that are retreating from this internationalist foreign policy and they oppose military action. Why do you think the GOP is divided on this? Well, first, I think the Democrats are also divided, and there are going to be some kind of left-wing Democrats who are going to vote against the president on this. I think for the Republicans, part of it is just um, anger at the president for the way he's treated Republicans and the Republican Party for four years. Um, secondly, I think there is a, a fear of the incompetence of this administration, which I think has just really badly mishandled Syria for two and a half years now, from, from the beginning of that rebellion against Assad. Um, it just sheer, gross, terrible incompetence coming right up to... to Today, when, you know, just a few days ago, last week the president, the secretary of state gives a couple of moving, tough war speeches, and then the president pulls the rug out from under him over the weekend. So I can see why Republicans are worried about giving this administration the power to do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and then thirdly, I think there's war weariness after Afghanistan and Iraq. And fourthly, I think there's a sense, you, uh, you look at Afghanistan, you look at Iraq, you look at Egypt, Libya, Syria, I think there's a sense also, man, the Middle East is just kind of hopeless and we should stay out of it. So I don't think this is very surprising. I, I, I think it's a mistake for the country uh, to turn away from this and say, you know, wrong address, don't talk to us about this. Uh, but I don't think it's at all surprising. What, if any other options, does the president have at this point? I mean, is there any hope that he can broker some kind of peace deal between the Assad regime and the opposition? No, I don't think so, because I think Assad is, uh, thinks he has military options. You know, he's got Iran behind him. He's got Hezbollah behind him. He's got Putin and Russia behind him. So why should he negotiate? I mean, he thinks he's doing okay. Well, maybe now he won't be able to use poison gas, but he can still use the artillery and other things he's been using to kill what is now a couple hundred thousand people, drive millions into being refugees. Um, why should he negotiate, particularly if it looks as if the United States is wavering. 
Public support for U.S. action in Syria appears especially weak. Congress seems reluctant to approve use of military force. Some in the international community, like the U.K., have backed away from involvement in Syria. Even Democrat Charlie Rangel says that the president's handling of Syria has been an embarrassment. What do you think all of this means or says about Barack Obama and his handling of the Syrian crisis? And do you think that the president is losing the power that past presidents have had in their handling of foreign affairs? Yeah, I think, I think um, there is a sense among Democrats as well as Republicans, among people who've supported the president, that there's just a lot of gross incompetence here. Um, this Syria crisis has been mishandled from the beginning. You get more recent. I mean, in June, the president said we give lethal aid to the rebels. Three months later, there's no lethal aid to the rebels. They don't seem to know what they're doing, uh, and they're wavering. So for friends and enemies, there's a sense that, that you really don't know where this administration stands. I think the president will probably get this congressional vote, but I think uh, the way he has handled this really weakens him. And, you know, since we have one president at a time, it weakens the United States. Israel has claimed a joint U.S. missile test in the Mediterranean. How do you view this? What's Israel's role in all of this going to be? Well, I think the Israelis uh, have drawn a red line of their own. And, and that red their red line is no giving Syrian missiles or d air defense systems or, above all, chemical weapons to Hezbollah, which is a terrorist group. And the Israelis have hit Syria, we know about four times publicly. I'm told there are a few more times that have not been made public. They really enforce their red line. And they have prevented those weapons from moving to Hezbollah and Lebanon so far. I think their view is they'll take care of themselves when it comes to that red line. When it comes to who should govern Syria um, and enforcing the international taboo on poison gas, you know, that's the responsibility of the international community, maybe led by the United States. But they'll take care of themselves and their own national interests. I wish we, I wish we were as tough-minded about our own foreign policy as they are about theirs. Elliot, last question for you. Syria has pledged reprisals for any Western strikes. Do you see Syria, Iran, Al-Qaeda, or Hezbollah allies striking back? Uh, I don't. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that, um, certainly in the case of Israel, they don't strike back. Israel bombed the Syrian nuclear reactor in 2007. What the Syrians did in response? Nothing. Um, Israel has killed a number of uh, terrorist leaders in Syria. Um, response? Nothing. So uh, I think if we are really tough and if we let Assad know privately, if there's any response to these strikes, the people who do it are going to be very, very sorry. I think there won't, uh, there won't be a response. I worry, of course, about terrorism. They've always got the option of terrorism. But you know, they've been trying to engage in terrorism against the United States anyway. So I think we have to accept that Hezbollah terrorism uh, and Syrian-supported terrorism is really a part of life anyway. All right. Elliot Abrams, thanks for joining us, and thank you for your insight. You're welcome. And thank you for watching Newsmax TV.